What is analytic ethics? Analytic ethics is the application of both or either. Logical positivism and ordinary language analysis to ethics. Who was G? E. Moore. George Edward Moore. 1873 to 1958 successfully revived epistemological and metaphysical realism and supported a common sense philosophical method he spent most of his career at cambridge university becoming a professor there in 1925 as an undergraduate moore was a member of the cambridge apostles a select intellectual group of Cambridge University undergraduates. He was editor of the top analytic journal, Mind, 1921-1947. Moore's main books are Philosophical Studies, 1922, Principia Ethica. 1903, and Some Main Problems of Philosophy, 1953. What was GE? Why wasn't Charles Pierce ever a professor of philosophy? Pierce did have a job as lecturer in logic at Johns Hopkins University. In Baltimore, from 1879 to 1891. But in 1883 he divorced Harriet Melusina Fay, to whom he had been married since 1862, and married Juliet Froisi. Froisi was thought to be a gypsy, and Pierce was said to have lived with her before their marriage. A scandal ensued and Pierce left his academic position. Pierce's only subsequent employment was for the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, which ended in 1901 due to congressional curtailment of funding. Pierce then did odd jobs and was employed as a consultant in chemical engineering. Sometimes, William James, 1842 to 1910 and other friends assisted him financially who was rudolf carnap rudolf carnap 1891 to 1970 is famous for his work on scientific verification. He received his PhD from the University of Jena. He was a member of the Vienna Circle until he left Germany in 1935 to teach at the University of Chicago and the University of California at Los Angeles. In his early work he focused on the logical structure of language and what it implied about the world. In the 1940s, Carnap worked on logic and introduced the idea of a state description, which is the linguistic form of a possible world, or the most complete description of the world that can be given in any language. Unlike earlier logical positivists, Carnap addressed the problem of inconclusive evidence. For actual scientific verification and the meaning of scientific terms, he argued for the use 
of probability in determining degrees of confirmation in place of absolute verification. Carnap's principal works include The Logical Structure of the World, 1928, English Translation, 1967. Philosophy and Logical Syntax, 1935, Introduction to Semantics, 1942, Formalization of Logic, 1943. Meaning and Necessity, A Study in Semantics and Modal Logic, 1947, and Logical Foundations of Probability, 1950. What is Truth Functional Logic? Truth functional logic preserves logical truth by substituting terms according to the rules of logic. The truth or falsity of a statement can be calculated according to the truth of its parts. For example, if A or not A, the law of non-contradiction, is a rule. Then if A is true, not A must be false, if A is false, then not A must be true. Compound sentences are true or false depending only on whether their components are true or false. For example, the sentence it is raining and cold is true if it is raining is true and it is cold is true. Truth functional logic is typically applied according to tables that indicate the truth values of Sentences that contain clauses linked by the connectives if, and, not, if then, and if and only if. The truth or falsity of the whole sentence depends on the truth or falsity of its components. According to the rules of logic that apply to each of the connectives. What are some other interesting facts about A? J. Eyre's life and career? Eyre was a prominent subject of academic gossip for his womanizing. He was married four times, and for his engagement in fashionable popular culture. There was an overall glamour to his life. Eyre's mother's family founded the French Citroën car company. And his father worked for the wealthy Rothschild family of bankers. He attended Eton, won a scholarship to Oxford, and served in the SO. Special Operations Executive, during World War II. Before the war, while on a visit to New York, Eyre made a record with actress Lauren Bacall. He supported the Tottenham Hotspur Football Club and was known to its fans as the Prof. Eyre was also a secular humanist. He was honorary associate of the Rationalist Press Association after 1947 and a successor to evolutionary biologist and humanist. Julian Huxley when he became president of the British Humanist Association. In 1965, Eyre was named the first president of the Agnostics Adoption Society. He edited the anthology The Humanist Outlook in 1965. At the peak of his career, Eyre served as a sort of in-house atheist for the British Broadcasting Corporation. He debated the Jesuit philosopher Frederick Copleston, 1907-1994, on the subject of religion. Copleston was the author of the nine-volume History of Philosophy. 
1946-1975, so the two were matched in erudition. Ayer, apparently briefly, revised his lifelong atheism after a near death. Experience in 1989 brought on by choking on a piece of smoked salmon. Toward the end of his life, though, he said, what I should have said is that my experiences have weakened. Not my belief that there is no life after death, but my inflexible attitude towards that belief. What is verificationism? Verificationism is a theory of meaning. The meaning of a statement is its empirical methods of verification that ultimately yields sensory information. For contemporary verificationists such as Michael Dumet, 1925. This meant that the truth of sentences must be related to the ways in which they are or can be verified. What was Williams James' main contribution to psychology? James developed the same theory that was independently developed by Carl George Lang, 1834-1900. The Danish physician and psychologist. It became known as the James Lang theory of the emotions. The theory is that emotions are our experience of changes in our bodies. Benedict de Spinoza, 1632-1677, had held that emotions are the effects of our beliefs, while René Descartes, 1596-1650, in Passions of the Soul, 1649, had expressed an earlier version of the James Lang theory. Our common sense assumption is that emotions are reactions to events in the world that are mediated by our understanding. By contrast, the James Lang theory held that our bodies react directly to the world and our awareness of this physical reaction constitutes our emotions. Moore's Common Sense Philosophy Moore made a distinction between what philosophers claim and what ordinary people believe. He wrote, I do not think that the world or the sciences would ever have suggested to me any philosophical problems. What has suggested philosophical problems to me is things which other philosophers have said about the world or the sciences. His own philosophical approach was to analyze concepts or the meanings of words by determining the difference between any one concept before the mind or under consideration as an object of thought and other concepts. In his writing, Moore demonstrated a methodical and thorough style of analysis. It was this calm, painstaking clarity that established his philosophical stature in the 20th century. How did G.E. What was Bertrand Russell's theory of knowledge?
Russell distinguished between two kinds of knowledge. Knowledge by acquaintance was direct knowledge of sense data, mental states, thoughts, and feeling. More indirect knowledge by description was ultimately based on knowledge by acquaintance. For example, I have knowledge by acquaintance of this page as I am typing it into my computer. But knowledge by description of Burma, where I have never been. Who or what were the Cambridge Apostles? His was the undergraduate club at Cambridge University to which G. E. Moore, and some of the male writers who held him in high esteem, belonged. The Cambridge Apostles, or Cambridge Conversation Society was founded in 1820 by George Tomlinson, who was later Bishop of Gibraltar. There were originally 12 members, hence the name. They met on Saturday nights for discussion after one member presented a paper and they ate whales, which were sardines on toast. The apostles have always been a quasi-secret society with an annual dinner and a meeting in London every so often. Women could not be considered for membership until 1970, when the Cambridge spy ring was disclosed in 1951, four of its members were former apostles, and two who were employed in high government offices, had given the KGB sensitive information. The Cambridge spy ring consisted of five British young men who attended Cambridge University and were recruited to spy for the Soviet Union during the 1930s. They infiltrated the highest levels of British government and betrayed top secrets to the Soviet Union. What was logical atomism? The main claim of logical atomists was that the world is made up of logical facts. These logical facts are like atoms because they can't be divided into smaller facts. Single logical facts can be combined by truth functional logic into molecular facts. To apply the theory of logical atomism to more complex statements. Such as the claims of science, the method of logical construction was posited. In logical construction, any S represents a logical construction of PS if statements about S can be reduced to atomic statements about PS. For example, a salad is a logical construction of its ingredients. And perceptions of ordinary objects are logical constructions of sense data. Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970, and Ludwig Wittgenstein. 1889-1951, were the main proponents of this perspective. What was Otto Neurath's main philosophical contribution? First, Neurath thought that the only connection between language and reality was metaphorical, and he believed that at best, language and world coincide only because reality is all previously verified sentences. 
this required a coherence theory of truth for each individual sentence. A sentence is true if it coheres with already verified sentences. Only the entire language system can be verified. Neurath famously wrote, We are like sailors who on the open sea must reconstruct their ship but are never able to start afresh from the bottom. Where a beam is taken away a new one must at once be put there. And for this the rest of the ship is used as support. In this way, by using the old beams and driftwood the ship can be shaped entirely anew. But only by gradual reconstruction. Second, Neurath did not think that phenomenalism could provide a valid foundation for scientific language because sense data are subjective. His alternative was to propose that mathematical physics be used for objective descriptions. A doctrine known as physicalism. Furthermore, language itself could be described in the language of mathematical physics because it is material. Constituted by sounds and graphic symbols. What was Charles Pierce's fourth system? Pierce's fourth system, 1885 to 1914, introduced evolution to his second system. The whole system of sign-object interpreton, with its infinite implications, is an evolving system. The system has evolved over time and continues to evolve. As does our knowledge of it, and every sign within it. Pierce worked out many details of this process, in logic, and in what others considered pragmatism. He ended up with an extreme form of idealism that posited the entire universe as a living. Feeling organism, with habits that are mirrored in our general laws of nature, descriptions of regularities. What was Charles Pierce's philosophical system? Pierce's philosophical views had idealist underpinnings. He had four systems. In his first system, 1859 to 1861, he agreed with Immanuel Kant. 1724 to 1804, that things in themselves could not be known either in science or philosophy. Science is concerned with phenomena, or what appears in experience. But there is an objective world underlying phenomena, or what is known. There are three kinds of things, one, matter, two, mind, and three, God or it, thou, and I, which Pierce called firstness, secondness and thirdness, respectively. Pierce thought that ideas in God's mind are as material as objects in our experience. However, he encountered logical problems with this system and was not quite satisfied. With the relation between the Kantian categories and the things in themselves. In his second system of thought, 1866 to 1970, Pierce used Hegelian methodology and assumptions to conclude that what was most real was a dynamic system. He thought that the world of experience or phenomena, which he called the Phaneron, 
is entirely made up of signs which are qualities, relations, things, events everything and that these signs are all meaningful. The meaning of each sign is part of a system that also contains the object and the interpreton. The object is what the sign is a sign of. The interpreton is the feature or activity of mind that experiences the sign. And, the interpreton is also a sign because everything is. A sign so it also has an object and a second interpreton. What was the influence of logical atomism? As a philosophical doctrine, logical atomism was surpassed by logical positivism. However, its main rhetorical force did demolish what Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970, termed logical holism. Or the notion that the world is a whole, no part of which can be known independently of all others. Logical holism was the epistemological doctrine associated with absolute idealism. How was G. E. More a realist? Moore was at times a naive realist and at other times a representative. Realist All realists believe that there is a real, external world. Naive realists hold that we directly perceive objects in this world. Representative realists think that what we perceive are the effects of those objects on our organs of sense. Or, in other words, that what we perceive are not objects but sense data caused by real objects. What was tragic about Schlick's death? After the Nazis came to power in Germany and Austria. Many members of the Vienna Circle fled to the United States and England. Schlick remained. Although not Jewish, he was distressed by what was then happening in Germany. While walking up some steps at the University of Vienna to teach a class on June 22, 1936, Johann Nelbach a former student, confronted Schlick with a pistol and shot him. Schlick died of a chest wound. Nelbach was convicted but soon pardoned, after which he became a member of the Nazi party. Although Schlick was not Jewish, logical positivism was condemned as Jewish thought by the Nazis. What was Charles Pierce's pragmatism? Pierce's starting point in his pragmatism was his activity and self-identification as a scientist. Pierce thought that philosophy was philosophy of science and that logic was the logic of science. As a pragmatist, Pierce is best known for two articles, The Fixation of Belief and How to Make Our Ideas Clear. Published in Popular Science Monthly, under different titles, in 1877 and 1878, respectively. In these works, he defended science as the best way to overcome. 
doubt and presented the pragmatist idea of clear concepts. He claimed that concepts, or the meanings of scientific terms, must have cash value. The cash value of a concept is the difference it makes in experience to have the concept. Compared with not having it. The entire meaning of a clear concept lay in its consequences. The consequences meaning of a scientific concept were Possible observations under conditions that could be specified. That is, the concept had to generate predictions and it doesn't matter if the predictions were accurate or not. Just so long as it could predict something that would happen. Who was A? J. Air. Sir Alfred Jules, Freddie, Air, 1910-1989, was the British logical positivist who became famous for his language. Truth and Logic, 1936, which was followed by The Problem of Knowledge, 1956. Air's main contribution was to relate logical positivism to traditional philosophy. Which in no uncertain terms resulted in a devastating attack on metaphysics, ethics, and religion. The attack was on the meaning of terms used in these fields and resulted in the claim that they were meaningless. Ayer was the Grote Professor of the Philosophy of Mind and Logic at the University College London from 1946 until 1959. And after that the Wickham Professor of Logic at the University of Oxford. From 1951 to 1952 he was President of the prestigious Aristotelian Society. In 1973 he became a Knight in the Legion of Honor. Ayer's publications include Philosophical Essays, 1954, The Concept of a Person and Other Essays. 1956, The Origins of Pragmatism, 1958, Metaphysics and Common Sense, 1969. Russell and Moore, the Analytical Heritage, 1971, Probability and Evidence, 1972, Bertrand Russell. 1972, The Central Questions of Philosophy, 1973, Hume, 1980, Philosophy in the Twentieth Century. 1982, Freedom and Morality and Other Essays, 1984, Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1986, Part of My Life. 1977, and More of My Life, 1984, as well as numerous articles on related topics. Who was Moritz Schlick? Moritz Schlick, 1882-1936, is famous for claiming that philosophy was dependent on science, intellectually. He was a philosopher who studied with the physicist Max Planck before arriving in Vienna, Austria, in 1922. His presence was the inspiration for the mathematician Hans Hahn. To inaugurate the discussion group of the Vienna Circle, which, in addition to Hahn and Schlick, at first contained Otto Neuroth, 1882 to 1945, 
and the physicist Philip Frank. Rudolf Carnap, 1891-1970, joined them in 1926. Schlick was professor of the philosophy of inductive sciences at the University of Vienna, while he led the Vienna Circle. He believed that empirical knowledge was not about the content of experience, which could not be communicated, but about the form of experience. He maintained that all genuine philosophical problems and questions were either mathematical or logical, or could be solved by scientific investigation. Schlick believed that this implied that philosophy had no subject matter of its own that was distinct from the sciences. However, unlike other logical positivists, he thought that ethics were practical and that moral goodness was simply whatever is approved by society. Moral obligation could be studied as what is generally required by society. His main works include General Theory of Knowledge. Second edition, 1925, and Problems of Ethics, translated, 1939. What were William James' theories concerning religion and free will? James thought that whether or not to believe in God, or to believe that we have free will, and that there are objective values, cannot be decided neutrally by an appeal to facts. The facts in such matters are inconclusive, and a neutral intellectual position does not address the importance to us of whether or not God exists, or if we have free will, or whether there are objective values. Because our beliefs in such matters will make a difference in our lives and those of others. We must will to believe that God exists, that we have free will, and that there are objective values. In the case of free will, to motivate ourselves toward actions that are unpleasant, we should think about their positive consequences. James offered an example of this, when one is reluctant to arise from bed on a cold morning. If one thinks about what one will do that day the necessary physical motion becomes almost automatic. Who was William James? William James, 1842-1910 built on Charles Pierce's, 1839-1914. Pragmatist ideas to create a more humanistic form of pragmatism. James was also the founder of modern psychology as a science independent of subjective introspection. His principal works include The Principles of Psychology, 1890, the Will to Believe and Other Essays in Popular Philosophy. 1897, The Varieties of Religious Experience, 1901-1902, and Pragmatism, 1907. How did William James come to develop pragmatism? During the 1870s, James participated in a discussion group that became known as the Metaphysical Club. 
Its members included Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839-1914, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, 1841-1935, and mathematician and philosopher Chauncey Wright, 1830-1875. While the group was meeting, there was some concern on the part of civic leaders in New England that religion, particularly Protestantism, was suffering as a result of the popularity of Darwinism and intense interest in the sciences. At the time James began to teach philosophy. Harvard administrators had an interest in the potential of philosophy to support religion. When James began his career, the disciplinary boundaries between psychology and philosophy were fluid. Largely as the result of his work, the two fields were distinct by the end of his career. To this day, William James Hall houses the Harvard Department of Psychology. How did A. J. Air defeat Mike Tyson? This is an oft told story that those who knew Air said sounded exactly like him. When, at the age of 77, Air was a visiting professor at Bard College in 1987. He went to a party hosted by fashion designer Fernando Sanchez. Air noticed that the professional heavyweight boxer Mike Tyson was annoying model Naomi Campbell. Air told Tyson to back off, and Tyson responded, Do you know who the fuck I am? I'm the heavyweight champion of the world. Air shot back and I am the former Wickham Professor of Logic. We are both preeminent in our field. I suggest that we talk about this like rational men. Ear and Tyson did have a conversation, and Naomi Campbell, who was not yet famous, took advantage of this diversion to elude them both. What was AJ? What is the difference between ethics and morals? Philosophers tend to use the terms interchangeably. In ordinary usage, however, morals refers to private behavior. Whereas ethics refers to public, professional, or civic behavior. Thus, while judgments about a person's morals can be about sexual behavior and drinking habits, judgments about ethics often concern the obligations of people in positions of responsibility, for example, medical ethics. What is the difference between ethics and morals? Philosophers tend to use the terms interchangeably. In ordinary usage, however, morals refers to private behavior. Whereas ethics refers to public, professional, or civic behavior. Thus, while judgments about a person's morals can be about sexual behavior and drinking habits, judgments about ethics often concern the obligations of people in positions of responsibility, for example, 
Medical Ethics What is the difference between a moral system and a moral theory? A moral system specifies principles according to which people should act. Such as deontological or duty ethics, utilitarianism, or virtue ethics. A moral theory is an account of basic moral terms such as good or evil and the nature of moral judgments and arguments. Moral theorists may also compare different moral systems. What is the difference between a moral system and a moral theory? A moral system specifies principles according to which people should act. Such as deontological or duty ethics, utilitarianism, or virtue ethics. A moral theory is an account of basic moral terms such as good or evil and the nature of moral judgments and arguments. Moral theorists may also compare different moral systems. What is moral conventionalism? Ethical or moral conventionalism is the view that what makes Something good or an action right is a general cultural belief. Ethical conventionalism has descriptive and prescriptive forms. Prescriptive conventionalism says that we ought to follow conventions, descriptive conventionalism says that we do follow conventions. What is moral conventionalism? Ethical or moral conventionalism is the view that what makes something good or an action right is a general cultural belief. Ethical conventionalism has descriptive and prescriptive forms. Prescriptive conventionalism says that we ought to follow conventions, descriptive conventionalism says that we do follow conventions. What is ethical, or moral, relativism? There are two kinds, descriptive moral relativism is the view that different cultures have different moral beliefs. Prescriptive or normative moral relativism is the view that the whole of what's right is what people in a given society think is right. The result of this view is that moral disagreement can't be rationally debated. What is ethical, or moral, relativism? There are two kinds, descriptive moral relativism is the view that different cultures have different moral beliefs. Prescriptive or normative moral relativism is the view that the whole of what's right is what people in a given society think is right.
the result of this view is that moral disagreement can't be rationally debated. How do philosophers deal with ethical relativism? Philosophers intensely dislike prescriptive ethical relativism. It makes the analysis of moral terms and the construction of moral systems pointless because there is no way to justify them. Different positions have been taken about descriptive moral relativism. Some philosophers deny it, claiming that once we understand moral systems that seem to be different from our own, we can derive universal moral principles from all moral systems that apply to all human beings. Others have argued that even though there are different viewpoints about what is morally right, some of those viewpoints are simply wrong, and then their job is to show how they are wrong. How do philosophers deal with ethical relativism? Philosophers intensely dislike prescriptive ethical relativism. It makes the analysis of moral terms and the construction of moral systems pointless because there is no way to justify them. Different positions have been taken about descriptive moral relativism. Some philosophers deny it claiming that once we understand moral systems that seem to be different from our own, we can derive universal moral principles from all moral systems that apply to all human beings. Others have argued that even though there are different viewpoints about what is morally right, some of those viewpoints are simply wrong, and then their job is to show how they are wrong. What was G. E. Moore's naturalistic fallacy? Moore, 1873 to 1958, contended that goodness cannot be analyzed in terms of any other property. In his Principia Ethica, 1903, he wrote it may be true that all things which are good are also something else. Just as it is true that all things which are yellow produce a certain kind of vibration in the light. And it is a fact, that ethics aims at discovering what are those other properties belonging to all things which are good. But far too many philosophers have thought that when they named those other properties they were actually defining good. Moore thought that we know what is good directly, just as we know the color yellow when we see it. Thus, we can only point to an action or a thing and say that is good. We cannot describe to a blind man exactly what yellow is. We can only show a sighted man a piece of yellow paper or a yellow scrap of cloth and say that is yellow. The same is true of what is good. What was G? E. Moore's naturalistic fallacy. Moore, 1873 to 1958, 
contended that goodness cannot be analyzed in terms of any other property. In his Principia Ethica, 1903, he wrote, It may be true that all things which are good are also something else. Just as it is true that all things which are yellow produce a certain kind of vibration in the light. And it is a fact, that ethics aims at discovering what are those other properties belonging to all things which are good. But far too many philosophers have thought that when they named those other properties they were actually defining good. More thought that we know what is good directly, just as we know the color yellow when we see it. Thus, we can only point to an action or a thing and say that is good. We cannot describe to a blind man exactly what yellow is. We can only show a sighted man a piece of yellow paper or a yellow scrap of cloth and say that is yellow. The same is true of what is good. What was the emotivist theory of ethics? According to the logical positivists, statements had meaning only if it could be said what would verify or falsify them. In terms of descriptions of sensory experience, because both moral and aesthetic statements could not meet this test. They were considered not to have empirical meaning but to be expressive of how the person uttering them felt. So, to say, this is right, would be equal to saying, I like this. A.J. Eyre 1910-1989, put forth this view in language, truth, and logic. 1936. A more comprehensive account was given by Charles L. Stevenson, 1908 to 1979, in Ethics and Language, 1944. Stevenson argued that moral judgments do not have cognitive meaning, but rather emotive meaning. He meant that moral judgments are not factual in nature, but are rather emotional reactions to facts, which are sometimes meant to influence others. If the facts or other circumstances changed, so could the moral judgment. What was the emotivist theory of ethics? According to the logical positivists, statements had meaning only if it could be said what would verify or falsify them. In terms of descriptions of sensory experience, because both moral and aesthetic statements could not meet this test. They were considered not to have empirical meaning but to be expressive of how the person uttering them felt. So, to say, this is right, would be equal to saying, I like this. A.J. Eyre 1910-1989, put forth this view in language, truth, and logic. 1936. A more comprehensive account was given by Charles L. Stevenson, 1908 to 1979, in Ethics and Language, 1944. Stevenson argued that moral judgments do not have cognitive meaning, but rather emotive meaning. He meant that moral judgments are not factual in nature, but are rather emotional reactions to facts, 
which are sometimes meant to influence others. If the facts or other circumstances changed, so could the moral judgment. What was the Bloomsbury Group? He Bloomsbury Group was a loose group of friends, the men of which were Cambridge graduates. They met in the evenings for drink and talk at the house of author Virginia Woolf's sister, Vanessa Bell. The house was in the Bloomsbury district of London, and hence this name. Its initial members, before 1910, were, the novelist E. M. Forster, Mary McCarthy, and Virginia Woolf, economist John Maynard Keynes, the novelist, biographer, and critic Lytton Strachey, and the painters Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell, and Roger Fry. All were close or intimate friends long before they individually became famous. G. E. Moore 1873-1958, served as an intellectual ideal and mentor to the group. He was particularly revered by the others for his Principia Ethica. 1903, and the model of clarity he provided for all intellectual work. Above all, the Bloomsbury members were inspired by Moore's idea that art and friendship have intrinsic value they re good in themselves and serve no higher purpose. What was the Bloomsbury Group? He Bloomsbury Group was a loose group of friends, the men of which were Cambridge graduates. They met in the evenings for drink and talk at the house of author Virginia Woolf's sister, Vanessa Bell. The house was in the Bloomsbury district of London, and hence this name. Its initial members, before 1910, were, the novelist E. M. Forster, Mary McCarthy, and Virginia Woolf, economist John Maynard Keynes, the novelist, biographer, and critic Lytton Strachey, and the painters Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell, and Roger Fry. All were close or intimate friends long before they individually became famous. G. E. Moore 1873-1958, served as an intellectual ideal and mentor to the group. He was particularly revered by the others for his Principia Ethica. 1903, and the model of clarity he provided for all intellectual work. Above all, the Bloomsbury members were inspired by Moore's idea that art and friendship have intrinsic value they re good in themselves and serve no higher purpose. What is ethical subjectivism? Ethical subjectivism is either the same as ethical emotivism, or the view that ethical judgments express our shared emotions. Or else it refers to an individual's private moral views as the meaning of morality so that in principle there could be as many moral systems as there are individuals. What is ethical subjectivism?
ethical subjectivism is either the same as ethical emotivism, or the view that ethical judgments express our shared emotions. Or else it refers to an individual's private moral views as the meaning of morality. So that in principle there could be as many moral systems as there are individuals. How were virtue ethics rediscovered in analytic philosophy? Aristotelian virtue ethics, mainly as expressed in Aristotle's 384-322b. C. Nicomachene ethics were revisited in analytic philosophy to create rationalist moral systems according to aristotle we develop our individual virtues through a rational process of deliberating and then choosing what to do in action the revival of aristotelian ethics was sometimes pursued in Opposition to other prominent moral systems and moral theories. Philippa Foote, 1920, and Alastair McIntyre, 1929, are noteworthy 20th century virtue ethicists. How were virtue ethics rediscovered in analytic philosophy? Aristotelian virtue ethics, mainly as expressed in Aristotle's 384-322b. C. Nicomachean ethics, were revisited in analytic philosophy to create rationalist moral systems. According to Aristotle, we develop our individual virtues through a rational process of deliberating and then choosing what to do in action. The revival of Aristotelian ethics was sometimes pursued in opposition to other prominent moral systems and moral theories. Philippa Foote, 1920, and Alastair McIntyre, 1929, are noteworthy 20th century virtue ethicists. What was Philippa Foote's contribution to virtue ethics? Philippa Ruth Foote, 1920, who is the granddaughter of you. S. President Grover Cleveland opposes subjectivism or emotivism in ethics and insists on a connection between morality and rationality. She has tried to undermine a fact-slash-value divide in claiming that moral judgments are determined by facts about our lives and nature. In this sense, she is a moral naturalist. Moral naturalism is the view that what is morally good is not some distinct and special quality but ordinary things and actions that have been rationally chosen as best in a particular set of circumstances. Overall, Foote has consistently supported virtues as conducive to self-interest. Her Main publications are Virtues and Vices and Other Essays in Moral Philosophy, 1978. Natural Goodness, 2001, and Moral Dilemmas, and Other Topics in Moral Philosophy, 2002.
What was Philippa Foote's contribution to virtue ethics? Philippa Ruth Foote, 1920, who is the granddaughter of you? S. President Grover Cleveland, opposes subjectivism or emotivism in Ethics and insists on a connection between morality and rationality. She has tried to undermine a fact-slash-value divide in claiming that Moral judgments are determined by facts about our lives and nature. In this sense, she is a moral naturalist. Moral naturalism is the view that what is morally good is not some distinct and special quality but ordinary things and actions that have been rationally chosen as best in a particular set of circumstances. Overall, Foote has consistently supported virtues as conducive to self-interest. Her Main publications are Virtues and Vices and Other Essays in Moral Philosophy, 1978. Natural Goodness, 2001, and Moral Dilemmas, and Other Topics in Moral Philosophy, 2002. What is Ethical Naturalism? Ethical naturalism holds that goodness is a natural property and that morality can be understood without intuitions, conscience, or religion. What is ethical naturalism? Ethical naturalism holds that goodness is a natural property and that morality can be understood without intuitions, conscience, or religion. What is Bertrand Russell's theory of types? Russell began with a puzzle inspired by the German philosopher Gottlob Frege's 1848 to 1925 attempt to reduce mathematics to logic. Is the class of all classes that are not members of themselves or C itself a member of itself? This question seems valid, but Russell showed that it leads to contradictions. If C is a member of itself then it should not be in D. Which is the class of classes that are not members of themselves, but if C is a member of itself, it will be in D. But if C is not a member of itself, then it should be in D, and C is a member of itself. Russell's answer was that there is a hierarchy of types of things that restricts what can be said about them. So we can say that Russell is an analytic philosopher. But not that a group of people are an analytic philosopher. What was Philippa Foote's contribution to virtue ethics? Philippa Ruth Foote, 1920, who is the granddaughter of you. S. President Grover Cleveland, opposes subjectivism or emotivism in Ethics and insists on a connection between morality and rationality.
she has tried to undermine a fact slash value divide in claiming that moral judgments are determined by facts about our lives and nature. In this sense, she is a moral naturalist. Moral naturalism is the view that what is morally good is not some distinct and special quality but ordinary things and actions that have been rationally chosen as best in a particular set of circumstances. Overall, Foote has consistently supported virtues as conducive to self-interest. Her Main publications are Virtues and Vices and Other Essays in Moral Philosophy, 1978. Natural Goodness, 2001, and Moral Dilemmas, and Other Topics in Moral Philosophy, 2002. What are some facts about Ludwig Wittgenstein's life? Quite a lot is known about Wittgenstein's life, although not everything is completely understood. Some stories seem to be in the realm of legends. Wittgenstein was born in 1889 in Vienna, Austria, to a famous and wealthy family of Jewish ancestry. His paternal grandparents were Jews who converted to Protestantism. And his mother was Catholic, although her father was of Jewish descent. Ludwig was the youngest of eight children, who were all exposed to high culture. Composer Johannes Brahms was a friend of the family. Although Ludwig was baptized as a Catholic, when he confessed his sins to friends later in life. Among his admitted transgressions was the fact that he allowed others to assume he was not Jewish. Ludwig had four brothers, three of whom committed suicide. When his father died in 1913, Ludwig inherited a vast fortune, which he gave away. In 1938, after Germany annexed Austria, he was able to protect his sisters from being sent to concentration camps by giving the German government millions of dollars in gold. Wittgenstein's education included studying mechanical engineering in Berlin. In 1908 he moved to England to study aeronautics, which included experimenting with kites. This led to mathematics and then to philosophy. Insofar as it was a current pursuit to seek the foundations of mathematics in logic. A visit with the mathematician Gottlob Freya, 1848-1925, led Wittgenstein to meet Bertrand Russell. 1872-1970, at Cambridge University, where he studied logic with both G. E. Moore. 1873-1958, and Russell. But his studies were interrupted by World War I. During which he volunteered for the Austrian army and distinguished himself for bravery. Russell assisted Wittgenstein in publishing Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, 1922. Wittgenstein then taught elementary school in a rural area of Austria and also designed and built a modernist house in Vienna for his sister Gridel. Returning to Cambridge in 1929, he taught philosophy. Becoming a professor at Trinity College ten years later. He was a hospital porter during World War II and resigned his professorship in 1947. Moving to Ireland to write. Just before dying, 
he said, tell them I've had a wonderful life. Ray Monk's biography Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius, 1991 is considered definitive as both an intellectual and personal account of Wittgenstein's life. Who was John Dewey? John Dewey, 1859-1952 was the most famous philosopher in the United States during the early 20th century. He was a public intellectual during the decades when ordinary people, as well as intellectuals, filled halls to hear intellectually stimulating and edifying speeches. His interactive, pragmatic approach to ordinary life, education, and art appreciation has shaped American experience in fundamental ways that do not always refer to him by name. Although, or because, Dewey was shy, he wrote 37 books and more than 700 articles. His main publications include Psychology, 1887, Human Nature and Conduct, 1922, Experience and Nature. 1925, The Public and Its Problems, 1927, The Quest for Certainty, 1929, Philosophy and Civilization. 1932, A Common Faith, 1934, Art as Experience, 1934, Liberalism and Social Action. 1935, Logic, The Theory of Inquiry. 1938, Freedom and Culture, 1939, and Problems of Men, 1946. What was John Dewey's theory of art? First, Dewey thought that inquiry is an art, and he rejected what he called the spectator theory of knowledge. Whereby knowing is believed to be passive contemplation. According to Dewey, ordinary human life itself is a form of art. Because it is permeated with aesthetic qualities in human experience. For Dewey, all experience, or anything that can be called an experience, has an aesthetic quality that can be directly appreciated. An experience has an immediacy that is directly felt or had and which unites its constituents into the same whole. Dewey meant by this that we are not aware of the physical or chemical. Aspects of our experience but of holistic actions and qualities. For example, the runner does not experience her sprained ankle in the same way that the sports doctor examining her does. She has a united qualitative experience of strain and pain. Whereas the sports doctor understands her condition in terms of which exact tissues have been damaged. Dewey called the aesthetic qualities of experience tertiary qualities. Because experience is a kind of transaction. The aesthetic quality of an experience can change and become more meaningful toward a consummation. A consummation is the reconstruction of an experience by intelligence, for example, solving a problem. What is not aesthetic according to Dewey is what is slack or overly rigid. There is nothing in either scientific inquiry or practical. 
action that precludes the presence of aesthetic qualities. Who was Kurt Gödel? Kurt Gödel, 1906-1978, is famous for his theorem about mathematical systems, which appeared in a 1931 article titled On Formally Undecidable Propositions in Principia Mathematica and Related Systems. Originally published in German in the 1931 volume of the journal Minutescheft für Mathematik, monthly journal of mathematics. According to Gödel's theorem, every formal, mathematical or logical system is incomplete because there can always be a sentence expressing a truth that can't be proved in the system. To prove his theorem, Gödel invented a method for correlating formulas in logic with positive integers. What was the mission of the Vienna Circle? The aim of the group was to restate ideas about both scientific knowledge and philosophy. And establish a form of philosophy that would be close to science, unlike German idealism. The members did not think that philosophy had a positive content of its own. Or even a distinct epistemology or theory of knowledge. Rather, Philosophy should study the knowledge methods and claims of science and justify them. For example, they thought that Albert Einstein's theory of relativity had shown that philosophers could not have the last word on either space or time, as Kantians believed. Arithmetic was believed to be reducible to logic, and synthetic a priori knowledge. Rational knowledge derived from thought alone that was true to experience, was unnecessary. The principle of verification, or verificationism, was their main tenet. Whatever claims to knowledge could not be verified in the sciences was simply not knowledge. The manifesto of the circle was Wissenschaft like Weltfassung, der Wiener Kreis. The scientific conception of the world, the Vienna Circle, was published in 1929 and translated by Otto Neurath, 1882 to 1945, in his Empiricism and Sociology, 1973. The manifesto proclaims that the scientific world conception of the Vienna Circle is distinguished essentially by two features. First it is empiricist and positivist, there is knowledge only from experience. Second, the scientific world conception is marked by the application of a certain method. Namely logical analysis. Logical analysis is a way of using symbolic logic to determine whether sentences or their components refer to experience. Many logical positivists were also phenomenalists. What are some highlights of Jane Addams' life that led her to found Hull House? Adam's father was a mill owner and politician in Cedarville, Illinois. Her mother died when she was two, while giving birth to her ninth child. 
Adams attended Rockford Seminary, a women's college, failed in medical school, and became depressed for a decade, during which she traveled throughout Europe. Along the way she visited London's Toynbee Hall, which was a young men's community that helped poor Jewish and Irish immigrants in East London by working within these people's neighborhoods. Adams resolved to duplicate this plan. And in 1889 she founded Hull House in the near West Side community of Chicago. Hull House was run and operated by women. Adams had long-term relationships with her co-founder and college friend. Ellen Gates star, and, later on, with her colleague Mary Rosette Smith. Adam's work at Hull House, and other settlement houses based on it, made her well known, she became a very popular public speaker. She was involved in the founding of other progressive organizations such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Former President Theodore Roosevelt asked her to second his nomination for the presidency by the Bull Moose Progressive Party in 1912. Roosevelt had served three years as U.S. President after 1901, and a full term after 1904. The Progressive Party strongly supported women's rights and suffrage. However, Adams became a target for intense public criticism when she expressed both pacifist and feminist views before World War I. Toward the end of her life, she dedicated herself to world peace and African-American civil rights. What is the difference between a moral system and a moral theory? A moral system specifies principles according to which people should act, such as deontological or duty ethics, utilitarianism, or virtue ethics. A moral theory is an account of basic moral terms such as good or evil and the nature of moral judgments and arguments. Moral theorists may also compare different moral systems. How do philosophers deal with ethical relativism? Philosophers intensely dislike prescriptive ethical relativism. It makes the analysis of moral terms and the construction of moral systems pointless because there is no way to justify them. Different positions have been taken about descriptive moral relativism. Some philosophers deny it, claiming that once we understand moral systems that seem to be different from our own, we can derive universal moral principles from all moral systems that apply to all human beings. Others have argued that even though there are different viewpoints about what is morally right, some of those viewpoints are simply wrong, and then their job is to show how they are wrong. 